Ilan kati udah. Kayu sudah tuka. Ma patah lah kayu mau tuka. This morning, Pandian and his cousin are inspecting their python traps. Ma kayu mau tuka lagi. Ula mau kena kali. Sekibai macam ada lama mah kayu tera kena lah. Dia patah satu tu tera kena pun dia patah pergi besar besar dia tera kapla masuk pun sampai tiga inci juga. Dia sampai dia ambil kapal boleh masuk lah, itu pula boleh kena. Tak tak, satu-satu pun jaring pecah pergi. Tak boleh dia main kuat punya itu, main nak gaduh punya itu pula, main jagat punya lah. Every day, Pandian and Ganesan roam the jungles of Parak, just north of the capital Kuala Lumpur. They've been professional python hunters for 15 years, tasked with catching the most valuable reptiles for the luxury goods market. Hurra! A few meters away, a monitor lizard has been caught in a trap. But it's little consolation for Pandian. These giant lizards fetch just a quarter of a python's value. Their skin's less desirable and less lucrative. With its diamond patterning and iridescent tincture, the reticulated python is highly coveted in the world of leather goods. For more than 40 years, the rainforests of Southeast Asia have supplied major European fashion houses, including Gucci, Hermes, Prada, and Louis Vuitton. Worth more than $1 billion annually, it's an immensely profitable industry. Until 2004, up to 350,000 Malaysian pythons were killed each year for bags, belts, and shoes. Then, fearing the extinction of this protected species and condemning the permissiveness of the local authorities, the European Union banned the import of Malaysian snakeskins, a severe blow to the world's largest exporter. Ten years on, has Malaysia recovered from the impact of this ban? And where do the big brands get their stock today? After five hours of hunting in the scorching heat, Pandian and his cousin still have nothing. Pythons are becoming increasingly rare. Angga-angga nasi boleh dapat pun sepuluh ekor, kira sepuluh ekor, tara satu ekor. Ini macam kadang-kadang, kadang-kadang pun tara juga. Kira sekarang dapat pun susah saja. Susah pun, nanti kadang muslim pun maya susah lah itu macam dapat pun orang saja. Ah, maya susah. Kira ni bar, ni barang dah beli jendih cakap. A sign of impending extinction, or just a twist of fate. With no political will behind the protection of this endangered species, no official record of the population has been kept. After going a whole month without a single python and any source of income, Pandian decided to expand his hunting area. Now, it covers nearly 800 square kilometers of oil palm plantations. Like Pandian, several thousand Malaysians depend on python hunting for their livelihoods. At long last, Pandian's luck appears to be changing. A python has been caught in a trap. It's not venomous, but more than capable of suffocating a human. They can grow up to 10 meters in length and weigh in excess of 140 kilos. It's to avoid potentially fatal accidents that Pandian hunts with his cousin. The catch of the day is a female barely three meters long. It poses no risk to the two men. Orang lugu lah, tapi pagi sampai tengok ah, ni bula pun tengok tangkap juga, tapi hati puas juga. Tapi mau bula mau tengok orang mau kulit juga, mau kulit juga mau tengok ada luka ada lama mian luka ni. Ni tengok lama mian luka, ini semua luka ni. Tarama itu aduh, mora saja, 
Betul pasal ini tengok hati sikit sot. Tapi... Tolak pora! Their clients demand perfect skins. Even the slightest blemish can lower the price by half. After a long day of hunting, Pandian and his cousin return home with a meager haul. The two hunters are Malaysian Indian, the country's third largest minority. Their Tamil ancestors arrived at the end of the 19th century to work as slaves in the rubber plantations. At the time, the nation's primary resource. Two generations ago, Pandian's family reinvented themselves as python hunters. Tapi India memang ini barang dia suka tangkap tapi uang kita nampak juga. Kira ada surat gaji satu satu tempat tempat ada orang saja itu pasal dia ada suka suka bagi juga. Dia orang suka dia bagi. Tara tara suka kali dia tara tangkap saja lah. In the evening, a local buyer pays a visit to the hunter's community. Mr. Lau travels the region in search of fresh pythons for his exotic skins business. With his expert eye, Mr. Lau quickly notices the scars. <laughs> Since the ban on exports to the EU, the price of python has fallen dramatically. For his day's labor, Pandian gets just five euros. I know it's not, it's not a good catch, but this is what I can do for them. So I can get this much only. Unless the quality is good, we can pay more for him. Susah sikit lah, pagi sampai pusing, nanti abang pergi ikut juga, saya kita pun mau duit kat juga. Uh, kira tu macam mana macam, tengok. Nanti minyak air si, mau kedai sendiri duduk, makan pun tengok mana macam. Pandian has earned only 100 euros in the last few weeks. In a good month, he can make up to 500. Sekolah rupa dia. Pandian and his wife Saraswati have three children. His unstable salary is the sole income for the household. Kita dekat tarapu, kawan dekat minta lah, minta nanti bagi, bagi susu lah, mak makan semua mak beli mari. Tepasal ini hari mau pakai dua hari, tiga hari. Bila pergi, pergi lalu cari-cari ada dapat, baru tuang sedia sana. Tunggu pun, mereka setidur lah. Since an accident caused Pandian to lose sight in one eye, Saraswati has feared for her husband's life. Ada takut, saya marah dia. Saya marah berapa kali. Dia cakap, tak boleh, saya tak boleh lepas ni kerja. Saya marah. Kerja buat ni kerja juga dia cakap. Saya marah beberapa beberapa kali pun saya ada marah. Ada pergi klinik pun ada. Ada jahit empat belas empat belas jahitan di tangan. At 29 and without any formal qualifications, Pandian does not have a choice. Kalau mau kita pun terapi cah sudah bodoh. Karena mau sampai sekolah mau baca bye bye. Nanti dia pun sudah besar dan nanti kawin mau ke anak mau kereta ke. Jangan kaya lah. Ngamam makan cukup utang apa pun tak boleh duduk ke hamulis saja. There are ten companies nationwide involved in the buying and selling of pelts. But of these. Only Mr. Lau's family-run business agreed to open its doors. Once a specimen is bought, Mr. Lau's ten employees then cut and sun-dry the skin. This one, the quality okay. Sometimes we can reach 
40, 40 snakes. It's a good catch, 40, 50 snakes per day. And sometimes even uh, 15, 20. With over 100 hunters supplying him with stock, Mr. Lau is able to export between 8 and 10,000 python skins every year. That's as many as before the ban. But today, the Malaysian authorities require all vendors to hold hunting licenses. The fee is three months. That means the quota is something they control like this, uh, three months. If you hunt, apply 100 snakes, you can, hunt, uh, you can hunting 100 snakes for three months, not more than that. So if the quarter is finished earlier, let's say the hunters catch the snakes before three months or 100, so they must renew back every time. At 50 euros for 100 snakes, the hunters themselves cannot afford the license fee. So Mr. Lau covers the cost until business picks up again. Okay. By helping my hunters, uh, annually more than 50,000 ringgit for the license fee. So this is what we can do for them. So uh, because we are not earning much in this now. Unless we can export to Europe, we can get more profit, more margin profit for this. Forbidden from selling directly to European clients, Mr. Lau looks to the Asian market. Singapore, Hong Kong and South Korea. Uh, some customers, they, they want the big size, something like this, see? It's 30, 30 cm up, so I can, I, can, I can expand more, more to 40 cm up. So you can see the size, see, now it's 30 cm, 38. Okay, so now I'm trying to get uh, 40 cm. Three to hand, four handbags. Depend what size they want to make. They want small, maybe you can get more. Mr. Lau grapples for every centimeter he can get, because with new Eastern customers, the price per meter has dropped. Now, he's forced to sell his skins at two-thirds their original price. Karnita Krishnasamy works for Traffic, an international NGO campaigning to safeguard this endangered species. She says the export ban has helped prevent the reptiles from dying out. The trade suspension came into place because there was a... It was a huge volume of wild-caught export skins being declared from Malaysia. Um, and there wasn't sufficient verification to show that this volume of skins was from a legal and sustainable sources. And so they took a precautionary approach um, to essentially... It sends a message back to the Malaysian government that perhaps the current procedures needs to be re-looked at in terms of um, ensuring that the current systems in place provide for a legal and sustainable trade in Malaysia. Under scrutiny from the European Union, Malaysia has lost its place as the global market leader, making way for Indonesia, Singapore and Vietnam. Hello. Descended from a Chinese-Malaysian-Indian marriage, the Lao family made a promising start in business. When the demand for snakeskin first arose in Europe towards the end of the 1970s, it was Mr. Lau's father, the first reptile hunter in the region, who made a name for himself in the export market. My father went to hunting, I follow him. So I know the, the skills. <laughs> Back then, his exploits would make the headlines. Within just a few years, he had made his fortune. At the time, trade was totally unregulated. Mr. Lau Sr. is furious about the ban on exports to Europe. According to him, talk of extinction is preposterous. Oil palms, which now occupy 25% of non-urban land in Malaysia, 
are the best possible habitat for pythons. Because the bird now is a human, he he has many of these nests. What he's in the bottom, the nest is in the bottom. Is there any nest? Are there nests? 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 现在终于有很多老鼠吃，所以说蛇啊，它就多出来嘛。In 40 years, the Lau family business has killed more than 400,000 pythons for the luxury goods market. Slaughtering methods frequently come in for criticism, often suffocated or skinned alive. Animal rights activists have called the treatment of the reptiles unacceptable. In the Lau slaughterhouse. Decapitation is the method of choice. He does not understand the accusations of abuse. If you, if you they think python killing python is cruel, even the, if you eat the chicken also cruel. Body same, body is an animal. The difference is this wild and this profession. Before they are decapitated, the animals are stunned. A practice studies have shown to be the least traumatic method of slaughter. A small advance, considering that other countries like Vietnam still practice suffocation. Having been filled with water, the carcasses are hung out for several hours to make the skins expand. Gilberto is in charge of skinning. A prescribed practice in his native Indonesia, he arrived in Malaysia three years ago to work in the slaughterhouse. Kalau ular kita tengokan, kita tengok besar, kita pergi tangkap pak, nanti kita gilau. Jadi kita boleh maa itu bunuh lah, kita boleh potong nanti balai rumah dia punya itu arwah lah ikut lah. Tak ada di kalau ular sini tak ada kalau belus sana lah. Like two million other Indonesian workers, Gilberto left home in search of a better life in Malaysia. For his labors, he earns 320 euros per month, five times less than the cost of a cheap python skin bag. Bag, kasut, sama. Kalau enam ribu, kalau kun untuk saya, kirim kapun untuk anak-anak sekolah, beli makanan. Beli seluar baju macam lah. Luar negara tar beli lagi kita tar kerja lah. Pasal luar negara kan tar beli barang kan ini kulit kan. In the boutiques of the West, python skin bags sell for up to seven thousand euros a piece. The European market enjoys more than ninety-five percent of the industry's profits. What's left? Is shared around the manual laborers of Southeast Asia. With a view to increasing their revenue, the Lau family have expanded into other python products. The bladders are collected and dried, highly sought after in traditional Chinese medicine. They are reputed to cure flu and certain infections. As Mr. Lau sees it, no part of the snake should go to waste. In these freezers is a plentiful supply of meat. Sold at 50 cents a kilo, it's destined for the market stalls of Hong Kong and Vietnam. Dia orang makan ini, dia nggak unta orang sakit lah. Supaya orang barang sakit, tulang sakit, ah. Luru orang putih sama betenang lawan mejang, dia orang semua makan ini tulang. But in spite of his best efforts, meat and organ sales represent just 5% of the company's profits. And skins remain the primary source of income. Today, his son is preparing a shipment of 500 pieces. Ini kulit ulas sawah, kita sekarang ni prepare untuk ekspor ke Singapore. Dan kita perlu kumpul lah. Jadi biasa kita setiap dua bulan atau tiga bulan sekali bila ada cukup dia punya kuantiti kita mulai ekspor. 
this shipment, Mr. Lau expects to make 7,500 euros from his buyer in Singapore. But he's under no illusions. Despite the trading ban, these skins will eventually make their way to Europe. Other Asian companies to buy, I think they export to Europe. Because what I believe, I don't think Asian people use the Python skin. I think Europe people more, more prefer the, uh, this kind of leathers. People involved in the trade have found different avenues to ensure that the trade continues. So what's happened is they've rerouted the, the trade. Um, so, for example, what we've seen is that Singapore is receiving a lot more um, skins and in, in, at, an, at an international level, Singapore really is the most important player in terms of re-exports of skins into the EU, for example. And the EU is happy to receive skins from Singapore. Figures published by CITES, the International Regulator for Trade in Endangered Species, allows us to trace these export routes. They divulge, for example, that in the year 2009, France imported nearly 5,800 skins from Singapore. What's more, their shipping licenses even listed Malaysia as the origin of the goods. They should never have been allowed to enter Europe. Outside the law, Italy, Germany and Spain all did the same. Since then, the number of customs inspections has increased, but buyers have found new ways of sourcing their stock. This exotic skin tannery, the only one in Malaysia, is one of the country's largest exporters. Owned by a Chinese capital group, Sunny International exports 40,000 pre-tanned python skins every year. After three weeks of treatment in these blanching drums, whitened skins will sell at twice the rate of Mr. Lau's raw hides. Mr. Wang, the manager, has found a more direct way to reach his European buyers. Once in Turkey, Mr. Wang's stock can easily make its way into Europe. There are a number of exotic skin companies based in Istanbul. Posing as French designers, we got an interview with an intermediary. How many skins do you have in stock now? I don't. Three to four thousand skins. So every month I sell three to four thousand skins and I keep stock three to four thousand skins. Uh, do you have uh, skins from Malaysia also? Yes, but the Malaysia site is not good for Europe. You cannot get the skin into Europe with Malaysia Cytus. So we need to deliver with Indonesia Cytus. I can pass the customs w without any control. Yes, I know which one is Indonesia, which one is Malaysia, but it doesn't matter for you because nobody can say this is Indonesia, this is Malaysia by looking at the skin. From this exchange, it appears that laundering contraband Malaysian python skins is all too easy. All that's required? A fake sites license listing a false country of origin. Okay, and uh, um, do you have other clients from, from France? Of course. When questioned, not a single French luxury goods outlet would comment on the practice. There isn't a traceability system right now, whether at a national level or a regional level or international level. Um, such a system simply does not exist. Um, and it's not to say that we cannot implement a system. In fact, that is essentially what Traffic and a number of other parties are also pushing for, in that a traceability system is put into place to ensure that the skin being, the snake being caught by one individual, say from a location in Para, is the same skin um, being sold in one shop in, in the EU, for example. To ensure better traceability, as well as a sustainable trade, a solution was proposed by the traders themselves, livestock farming. Ya, atas atas dulu. Cewek mana? Oke. 
Okay. Mr. Lau is the first to trial the scheme in Malaysia. The purpose to get a good quality and breeding the snake for future uh, snake skin market. So then, uh, maybe in future we don't have uh, depend on the wild snakes. We can depend on the farm. So uh, it's really good. So this can uh, future also can avoid the extinction of the python. So he has already gathered 500 pythons for his farm. Beneath the shelter of the palm trees, he keeps his most prized possessions: newborns. This baby pythons. I just want to check. Make sure they already shed skin. Uh, the shed skin is ready to feed. I mean, we can feed them. We got different reds and birds. Mr. Lau will have to feed his snakes for four years before they reach adult size. An additional cost for his business. I cannot get the real figure now, because I, they not reach adult. But we really want, uh, want the real good price for this. With his farm, Mr. Lau is hopeful that one day the European Union will reopen its doors to Malaysian snakeskins. But will the luxury goods industry be prepared to pay a higher price for a legal and sustainable trade?